Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good? Good. If you have eyes, you will notice that Pastor John is not here this morning. He is in Florida visiting his granddaughter, not his son, his granddaughter. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like to think my grandpa agrees with you. So, today, we have a guest speaker. Some of you know him, some of you would not. I'd like to invite up Nathan Campos. For a time, Nathan was one of our directors of Frontline Youth Ministry. He grew up going here. Uh, and now he just recently became official with Things to Come Mission, like his father before him. Uh, officially a missionary also in Brazil as yes, well. Sir. He will be going over some of the things that they're doing there. There's a plethora, as we talked about last night, from youth to digital media to preaching to all these things. But yeah, I don't want to steal any of his thunder. Yes, sir. Good morning, me. Frontline Bible Church. Good morning, Frontline Bible Church. It's good to be here. It's good to be home. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Some of you guys look really good. Others look just like me, a little beaten down, a little rougher around the edges. It's okay. Um, I still found somebody to marry me. It's, it's still working out pretty well. So it's good to be here. I'm sure this is working. Is this working? Perfect. Um, you know, some of you guys know me since I was a little kid, or some of you might say a little brat, but, uh, you know, some of you guys, I've been here for many years attending this church as a member, um, worked here as well with the youth. Uh, you guys just have been my family for so long, uh, supporting me and sending me messages and commenting on my stuff while I'm in Brazil, and it's just very supportive. It's very good to be here. It's very good to see a lot of faces, um, have a lot of people remember me, you know. Uh, look a little different, maybe. I don't know if it's me being married. Um, this is actually a picture of my wife that, I don't know where I'm supposed to point this. I pointed it the right way. But this is my wife, Alini. She is my better half. She is way nicer than me, way more fun to be around. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here um, because of visa situations. She is a Brazilian. But hopefully in the future, you guys will be able to meet her and you guys will understand that she needs glasses, for sure. But um, this is my wife, and uh, for those of, those of you that do not know, um, we just became full-time missionaries with TCM in northern Brazil. We have been there working as local uh, national workers for about five, six years or so since we've been there, and we just became officially TCM missionaries. And the purpose of, of that is so we can be full-time in the ministry. Um, financially, and we can be working there. Um, just a little bit about where we're at. Uh, for those of you that do not know, still don't know where I'm supposed to point this. There you go. Um, we're in Brazil. This is one of our, we have many churches there that we've been able to be part of as establishing the local leadership and everything like that. We have some churches in Boa Viagem, some churches in Ibuda. These are all neighborhoods that we have in Brazil. We're actually working on a couple of church plants right now. One is in São Bento, which is about three, four hours away, in Abreu e Lima, and in Cabo, which are cities that are about 40, 45 minutes away, but people normally don't really drive cars there, so they take buses, so it'll take about three hours for them to get there. So we decided to start planting some churches there. Um, my wife works very closely with the kids' ministry there. Yes, with the kids' ministry there, um, we call it Project Abba. Some of you might know it. A lot of you have become supporters and have helped with our Christmas projects. We do a lot of after-school projects, a lot of different things that we help out, help out about weekly, about 50, 60 kids in the different, different neighborhoods. And we provide them with classes, with um, biblical education, uh, school education, and everything that happens. Um, public schools aren't exactly like they are here. You know, there's not very good teaching in public schools there, so we do a lot of that as well. We teach them how to read and how to become uh, a teenagers that will be able to go into high school and be able to continue to grow and actually grow in their faith as well. One of the things that I've worked with, actually while I was working here at Frontline, um, some of you might remember me as just a crazy middle school youth leader that I was, you know, hasn't changed much. Um, but uh, we work a lot with youth as well in Brazil. Uh, we have a big youth group there in all of our churches. We, have, we work with about 40 kids on a weekly basis. 
with indiv indiv uh, individual discipleships, uh, individual ministries, which each one of them, they're all part of ministries. 99% of them got saved in the program. So we do not deal with a lot of kids that know the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Um, we don't really deal with kids that come from Christian households. A lot of them, a lot of the boys come from absent father households. Um, I have maybe two teenagers at our churches that actually have fathers that are part of the church or have fathers that are actually involved at home. So most, um, if not all, have that situation at home where we're able to minister them and just teach them how to be men. And the, the, the reason for this is probably because we used to always have a big kids program. And for those of you who works, work with kids, you know how important that is. But what would happen was we would end up losing them at about 12, 13 years old um, to gangs, streets, everything else. And they would leave the church and then we would have a disconnect in the church as far as adults and kids. So we established a ministry, we call it Plug-In, to be able to get kids that were in the program and, you know, continue to instruct them in the Word of God and the grace message and be able to develop strong, faithful adults in the church and build a healthy church from that. So we deal with a lot of teenagers, a lot of boys, a lot of girls. Um, a lot of, there's a couple pictures there, top left, top right, I'm sorry, no, top left. Okay, a lot of those are youth leaders that we have there right now. They used to be kids in our program. We trained them and they're now youth leaders and they're part of that as well. We have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of events that we do. I don't, rem I don't know if you guys remember when you used to do Lost and Found here at Frontline with the youth, but we do that in Brazil, and they love it. They go crazy. I'm not sure the city of Recife, where we're at, likes it too much, but they love the event. They, we, we have a lot of volunteers with different cars and everything like that to be able to do that. Um, a, couple, a couple of the youth kids that we have, most of, uh, João is on the left. He's one of ours that... Uh, absentee father, you know, no Christian influence inside of the household. Uh, his mother is not very involved in his life, and now he's part of the church. He works in our media team, uh, accepted Christ last year, and is just really involved. I would love to share a thousand pictures with a thousand different stories, but I don't have that much time. So what I really wanted to do today with everybody is share a little bit what God uh, put in our heart as far as where we're at. The reason we're in Brazil, so we can be full-time in Brazil as missionaries. So the reason I'm actually here, and I'm here for about two months, is to raise some of our financial support um, as far as for us to be able to do it. And I've been pressing this for half an hour. There you go. Okay. Um, our goal is 2850. That's our goal ministry budget. So we can be able to do ministry effectively there. This is kind of how we've separated that. And I'm going to be out there so you can we can talk, we can, you can get to know me, you can find out more ways as far as how you can uh, become a partner and how you can uh, help us and what, we're, what God's doing through us in Brazil. We have a big project that we're actually working on uh, that we're hoping we can finish this, this coming year is try to get a car. Me and my wife do not own a car in Brazil. It's going to make our life a lot easier to be able to transport and go between the different church plants and be able to help out. But I'm going to be out there. There's a couple of these. You're more than willing to take their prayer letters, prayer cards, a little bit more about us if you already don't know me, but I'm a, I'm a big talker, so I will definitely talk to you as much as you would like or as much as you would have me talk to you, but that's kind of um, what our plans are and how our purpose is in Brazil as far as what we're doing there, but today what I wanted to share with you guys is uh, Pastor John and Pastor Brandon, they asked me to bring, to share something that was in my heart and I thought, you know, what's the thing that has everything to do with kind of what I do is missions. And I would like to share a little, about mission, a little bit about missions with you guys. And this is actually a car show that we have in Brazil. It's every week. Who likes cars here? Does anybody like cars? Okay, men. There you go. All right. I love cars. Don't really know much about them, but I love cars. And we take the men's group all the time to see these Volkswagen bugs and uh, just kind of admire them and everything like that. And we actually will go on some evangelistic outings. I'm not sure if that's what it's called, but we go and we try to evangelize the people there. And we talk to them and we have great conversation. And it's very interesting to see because you'll have about 50 different cars there, uh, different colors, 
you know, they'll, they'll, they'll really take care of the cars. They really like how they look and how, how they're not really available that much anymore. And I think the biggest thing when I was talking to some people there was how many of them want to be remembered by the car they drove. How many of them want to, when they see the car, they want to say, hey, that's how I do. I know it because of the car. I know it because that's the car that he drives. That's how you, they remember themselves. And I remember thinking as, I, as we were meeting with the men's group, that is not what I want to be remembered for. I don't want to be remembered by the car I drive or by my earthly possessions. I want to be remembered by my heavenly possessions, by what God has placed me in my heart to do, by what God has called me to do. And you know what's interesting? Um, if you go to your Bible, and you don't have to do this right now, but I'm sure if many of you are longtime Christians, if you look in the Bible and you try to find the word rapture, are you going to find that word there? We got some good Christians in here. Are you going to find that word there? I don't know. If you go to the Bible and you look for the word Trinity, are you going to find the word Trinity in there? No. But do we doubt the existence of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Do we? No, we don't. The same thing is with the word missions. Although we don't see the word missions in the Bible, God's purpose for missions is very clear. As far as his, his purpose for establishing and what it, what it actually means, it is emphasized in Scripture. In the Bible, and when I read the Bible, I know a lot of us like to think of it as a theological book. I do not. I like to think of it as a Bible, as a book, I'm sorry, about missions, which is God in action on behalf of the salvation of mankind. So when I say missions, that's what I mean. God in action on behalf of the salvation of mankind. So the Bible in its totality, it, is, it ascribes to only one intention of God, which is to what? To save mankind. That's God's one and only goal. It's to save mankind, is to bring the grace of uh, his grace to mankind. And if you want to open it with me on 1 Timothy 4, oh, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 2, 4. And that's, that's what I want to go into today. That's the verse that I want to kind of bring to our attention as we look into what God, God's purpose for missions is and how we fit into that. First Timothy 2, 4, we read, Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the precise truth. I'm going to read that one more time. Who desires all people to be saved. God, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the precise truth. There is nothing wrong with owning things. I don't want you to get home and say, honey, we got to sell the house. That's not, what I, that's not what God is trying to say here. But God's clear desire is to save mankind. It's to save man. Once you discover God's primary goal, which is to save man, then what is the question we ask? What is our part in it? What is my part in it? What is your part in it? If that's God's goal, then is my, is my objective for my earthly job? Is it my family? Is it, is it the church? What is, what is the purpose? What does God want me to do? If that's God's mission, how do I fit into that? Because we are not separate. As believers, we can't be separate from it. And for you to become actively engaged in what God is doing and saving mankind, we have to know three simple truths about missions. And that's kind of what I want to share with you today. So um, this is, I, I was thinking of a cool, catchy sermon title. I couldn't do it. This is going to be as simple as possible because I believe missions is a very simple concept. It's a very simple idea that God has placed as the purpose in the heart of the believer to be able to do that. So three simple truths about missions. The first simple truth is missions is the heart of God. Can you repeat that with me really quick, church? Missions is the heart of God. I've got to skip that here. I'm very bad with with passing these slides. Missions is the heart of God. Missions is so much the heart of God that he had one son, and guess what his job was? Missionary. That's what he, that's what, he was on earth for, 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 for 33 years. Three years he was doing ministry full time, and what was he doing? Going from place to place, sharing about the message, 
the kingdom message at the time, but yes, he was bringing forth what God called them to do. Mark 1.38, we read, and if you don't have your Bibles, you can just read it here with me. He says, and he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. There's no other reason why Jesus was on earth other than going from place to place to share that he was God the Son. There was a focus about Christ that I think that we need to learn. Jesus knew that he was sent to die on the cross for humanity, and his mission was to redeem people. And when we look at the Apostle Paul, we see the same kind of focus, the same kind of purpose that he had when we look at that. Ephesians 3, 8 and 9, we read, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. On earth, God had a, a, Christ had a very specific mission to save the Israelites, to save the world through the Israelites. And while on earth, Paul had made, he was made the messenger of the grace of God, the dispensation of God, the dispensation of grace. That was his reason to live. And you know, when I read this passage, you can tell he felt very humbled by this. This wasn't, a, uh, this wasn't a, a prideful thing. Like He was like, oh, of course. Of course it should be me, the Apostle Paul. I've studied all my life. No, he felt very humbled by this. When we look at it, he says, the very least of all. That's where we get the word cyst when we look at Scripture. The word cyst comes from that least of all. And does anybody know what this is? I don't know if you can see it from there. But this is Salt. And, you know, in Brazil, we use this on our meat. Here, you use this on your driveway. Very different concepts. Okay? Very, we use it as a joyful salt. You use it as a miserable salt. And I, and I remember when I was younger, we would have to just pour this out on the driveway. And, it, and when you look at a, a grain of salt... You don't really think this can melt all the snow in the driveway, do you? You don't just go, well, done. That would have been really nice for my chores when I was a kid. But no, you, you look at this and you don't really think that. But actually, if you throw this in the snow, you can actually see it kind of melt a little bit. Just that little grain of salt. And Paul, I think the idea here is saying, you know, even though I'm a little grain of salt, on this big, cold, snowy world, God has a purpose for me in this. And if we get enough of us together to be able to do that, that's when God's mission starts to actually impact the people of the world. It's when we work together. So Paul is saying, I am as small as a cyst in the mission of God, but I am playing a part in this. I am playing a part in this. God has called me to this. The whole idea of Paul here is to emphasize the message, not the messenger. That's his purpose when he's brought to, to share this message. And he says, I love the word that he says. He says, the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's the emphasis. And the riches, I like the word that he uses. It means abundance, the fullness. The fullness that can only be found in a relationship with Jesus. He's been called to that mission that's what he's been called to. Man, I, re I remember like, like it was yesterday. You know, I was, I was in college. I came with the, when I was in college uh, six years ago, I came with the idea that I was going to be a businessman. I don't know what about this makes you think businessman, but that's what I thought. And I was sure that going to college, doing business, that's what I was called to do. Okay, and I was... And I was working, I was making enough money, you know, I was, I was going to school, um, going out with my friends, I had friends, I don't know if you believe that or not, but I did. But still, no purpose, still no idea what God wanted me to do, still felt like there was nothing that I was doing at the moment that pointed back to God, I don't know if that makes sense to you. And I remember I was driving home from work one day, and this was maybe December, uh, and my dad called me. 
like every good father's. And I don't know if this was, I don't know what prompted him to do that, but he called me and he just asked, how's it going? And I just, I, I just said, okay, that's all right. And he asked me, what have you been doing with your time? And I don't know if I was in a state of just, you know, I was just thinking real deep about things, but I remember I just went, nothing worth mentioning. And he asked me a question that was, Nathan, what are you going to do with the life that God has given you? Our mission is not only to preach that Christ died for our sins, but that life can only truly be experienced when we surrender to the will of God daily. And that's the day that I decided to go into missions. And I'm, I don't know what kind of businessman I would have been, but I knew at that moment that I only had a couple years, uh, uh, I don't know how many years, to do what God had called me to do. And, th and at this moment, I realized that. And it was just like something just clicked. I don't know if you've had that moment where something just clicks and you know what God is calling you to do. And I'm not saying quit your jobs and go to Africa. I'm not saying quit your jobs and go to Brazil, even though I might like it a little bit. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying what has God called you to do? It's not... It's not the car you drive. It's not the amount of money you make. It's the souls that God chooses, that God, that God calls you to save, that he has put in your life. Missions is the heart of God because he believes that this is the only way people can experience true joy. It's not in what they do. It's who God has called to reach them into the gospel. I work with a lot of teenagers most of them come with, from two different perspectives, okay? They either come from um, the absent father household, maybe about 90, 95% of them. So their idea of God is very distorted. They either think of God as a very far away, unreachable, uninvolved person in their life. He exists, okay, but uh, not really for me, or I guess not really involved in my life. And then you have the other perspective, which is they see God as, a present father figure, but as an abusive father figure, like they have at their house. So they do everything they can to please their father in heaven as they do to their father on earth. Seeing that as a very wrong and distorted view of who God actually is. Can you imagine what that kind of does to a teenager's mindset as far as who God is? How they're supposed to live their life? how they're supposed to look at their future, how they're supposed to uh, do things on a day-to-day -day basis. Missions is the heart of God because it reaches people. It reaches teenagers. It reaches kids. It reaches adults. This is why missions is the heart of God, and it, this is why it should be our heart as well. When, we, when our heart is synchronized with Jesus' heart, then I will feel compelled a compelling desire to see people saved and in a relationship with him. Because missions is the heart of God. So if you want to become actively engaged in what God's doing to save mankind, what do you got to do? You got to make missions the heart, your heart, as it is the heart of God. And number two, the second truth that I wanted to share with you about missions. Simple truth. Missions is the hope of the condemned. Missions is the hope of the condemned. Could we read that with me really quick? One, two, three, and... Missions is the hope of the condemned. Do you believe that? Missions is the heart of God, but it is also the hope of the condemned, which is actually why it's so much the heart of God. It is the hope to all who don't know or don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I remember my father used to tell me this story. There is this, uh, this man, he goes to this island. It's a very... I believe, it, I believe it was an island in Fiji or something like that. But he goes there, and he meets up. He's going there to provide some water, food, and everything for the tribe there. And he meets up with the chief. And this chief had a big Christian influence a couple years back. And he says, hello, chief. Listen, I see your tribe is doing well. Um, it's good to see you guys are very civilized now. But I'm so sorry to hear that you guys were duped by this Christian stuff. You know, you guys just, these people came in and just told you about this Jesus, and I'm just sorry that that had to happen, and that you have to believe in that kind of thing, and that 
you know, it's just, it's very sad to see that you guys are so mentally weak. And the chief looks at him and he goes, sir, you see that rock over there? That's where we used to kill our victims. You see that stove over there? That is where we used to cook them up. If those Christians hadn't come here to share about Jesus, you would be our next dinner. And that is why it is the hope, and I, I know you, you guys can't relate as much to this chief, but the hope of the condemned is that of Jesus changing lives. It's him being able to go and change somebody from the inside out. Romans 10, verses 11 through, uh, I'm sorry, 12 to 13, we see, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And sometimes we don't live our life thinking that's real. We don't think it's that easy. It's that simple. But all who do that will be saved. And uh, God, he doesn't play favorites in the body of Christ. I know sometimes we think like that, you know. We think we're better off from the majority of the people because we have Christ. And in a way, I guess you're right. We are better off. But... If we live our lives as a religious relationship with God, we will live a dry and superficial lifestyle with Jesus. We will live a dry and superficial lifestyle with Jesus. The Christian life is not about rules, regulations, and all that thing. It's about resting in Jesus Christ for our needs and our desires. When he says hope for the condemned, that's what he means. When we share the gospel, we're not just explaining people how to get to heaven. We're explaining, we're sharing a relationship that frees us to live a life of rest and not restlessly working to find purpose in something else. When Jesus freed you, that's what he freed you from. You find your purpose in him, not in what you do, how you do it. That's just freedom. That's what, that's what it means. Many of us think that the only reason Jesus actually saved us is to spend eternity with him, which is a great blessing. But verse 12, as we just saw, said that he saved us to be what? Be rich in him. To be rich. We looked at that word before. The word rich carries the meaning of being full, satisfied, fulfilled. Let me ask you, are you full, satisfied, fulfilled in Jesus? That is what it means to have Christ. If you're satisfied in Christ, you lose all desire for any other type of life that leads to condemnation. This is the gospel we preach. It's the gospel of reconciliation. We're reconciled to the source of life. Reconciled to, to we, we're able to leave all the strongholds we struggle with, lose the power, the appeal that they have to us. They had to us. The gospel is not just about saving people from the sin. It's saving people from themselves. So when we preach the gospel, we're not just worried about some outside source, but it's saving people from their selfish desires, their selfish needs, what they think is better. Now that you're a believer, when you have a relationship with God, God freed you from the idea that you need to live a certain way to be happy. That you need to have a certain job to be happy. You're not happy with your spouse because it just wasn't the right one. That's not how it works. You find your joy in Jesus. It's a setting where we're free of our own strategy of living. We're able to set them free through the gospel from a mindset of living from themselves. It replaces that carnal desire of meeting our own needs, trusting in ourselves, to trusting in God and how he provides for us, for our needs, according to the glorious riches of Christ. That's what it means to be saved by grace. Not just a cool get out of a hell free card. It's a, God not only saved us from hell, but he saved us from a hell on earth from trying to find our heaven here and be able to accept the one who has set us free. This is the reason missions is the hope of the condemned. So if you want to get actively engaged in God's mission to save mankind, we first got to realize that missions is the heart of God, 
Missions is the hope of the condemned. And last, missions is the health of the church. Can we read that for me really loud, really quick? Missions is the health of the church. Missions is the health of the church. 2 Corinthians 6 1. 2 Corinthians 6 1. We read, working together with him. Then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Working what? Together in him. We're partners with God. I love the word that he uses there, together. We're partners with God. He's graciously allowed us to be part of spreading his grace to the world. You know, I love that word together. It comes from the word synergio in the Greek, and it means synergy. Very close words. It means synergy. That's where we get the word where we have synergy. And I want to read you the definition of synergy really quick. It means the interaction of two or more agents or for forces so that their combined effect is greater than the sum of their individual effect. What does that mean? That means that you and God, you make a great team. Better yet, me, you, God, we make the best team ever. We make the dream team. That is what God has, that, that's what God desires for us. And that's what is found in the church, in God's missions for our life. I believe that the reason why Paul is saying in the letter, he says in the later part of the, ver, uh, of the verse, he says, we appeal not to receive the grace of God in vain. I encourage you. I challenge you. I call you not to receive the grace, the, the, the loving kindness, the life, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the joy, the delight, the strength, the power, the freedom. None of that. Don't receive that in vain. Receive that as it is. The word vain is referring to something that is without eternal value. It is empty. It's void of true value. Like a Volkswagen bug. There is no true eternal value in a bug. Actually, in a couple years, there won't be any value in it. Not a couple, maybe, but eventually there is going to be no value in that. Don't have the goal of your life. I don't want to have the goal of my life to gather material things. And every time I think of material things, I think of the word vain. When I go to buy something, I just say, I just think, is this, is this, this is vain. This is how we're supposed to think as far as earthly possessions. Have a goal of seeing people transform by the power of the gospel. That's your goal. That's what you should go home with today. That's what you should realize is the true meaning of why God has put you on this earth. I, I love to say this. I've heard this quote before. And they say, there's only two things that you won't be able to do in heaven. Number one, you won't be able to sin. Thank God. Number two, you won't be able to share the gospel. Because there ain't going to be no unbelievers there. So why are you here? And, I'm, and it's not for you to sin. Don't take that away. It's for you to share the gospel, the message of grace. Can you see why Paul is so passionate about this? Why, 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 why he's really trying to get the point of really challenging people not to take the grace of God lightly, not to really take it for granted. It's only when churches, uh, when a church preaches the truth about the grace of God that its mission is fulfilled. It's not the colors of the walls. It's not how many chairs we have. It's not how nice the air is or, or, or how cool or how hot it is or, or, or the gym or anything like that. It's the amount of people that are coming to know Christ personally. Every church is as healthy as its burden for missions. I'm going to read that one more time. Every church is as healthy as its burden for missions. Show me an unhealthy church and I will show you a self-centered church church that cares about its own material needs. When we come to church and we complain about certain things, we don't complain about the empty seats. We complain about the song that it wasn't really the song. It didn't hit me that way today. There's nobody sitting next to you. There's nobody, there's nobody I brought to church. That's what should weigh heavy on my mind. That's what God has put in my heart. A healthy church is focused on the mission of saving people. Why? Because it's God's mission. That's what he has called us to do. If he's got one book, and the purpose of that book is to save mankind, why should our purpose be any different? Why should our calling be any different? You know, every time I see a church where division is happening, 
or, or, or I find that there are so, or, 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 or different groups inside of the church. Normally, it's a very self-absorbed with their own needs as a group that they have forgotten what it's all about. As a church, we have to ask ourselves always, have we forgotten what it's all about? Are we focused on what God has called us to do as a church? This is the church that God has placed, Frontline Bible Church, our church. He has placed it here. There is no other church right here in this spot. This is what God has called us to do, to save mankind in the area that we are at. The mission of the church is to reach people with the truth of the gospel, to do anything less than that will not only take away from the mission of the church, but it will also make it unhealthy. It will make it unhealthy. It won't be actually fulfilling the purpose that God has placed in us as a grace Bible church. The, ch the church was established to become a source of life for those who are living from themselves. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of people living from themselves. Am I wrong? At your job, how many people are living from themselves? Maybe your extended family, how many people are living from themselves? How many people, when you just go walk in the park, are living from themselves? But we don't want to be bothered. We don't want to ruin our free time. We don't want to get any trouble at our jobs. We don't want to have to deal with the burden of discipling a young woman, and a young man that doesn't have a fatherly figure or, or a motherly figure. We don't want to have that burden. I don't want somebody to depend on me that much. I want to just do me. This is what God has called us to do as a church, as individuals. This building is so that you can encourage each other to go in your week and do that. Encourage people in different cities. Encourage people in different countries. Healthy churches prioritize missions because they have the same desire that God has. Let me ask you frontline: Do you have the same desire that, God's, that God has? Is this what God has put in your heart? Is this what God has put in my heart to do? Is this my purpose here? The church was established to become a source of life. We are that source of life through Jesus Christ. But what can I do? What am I supposed to do? There's a Coca-Cola uh, slogan that I really like. Sometimes I think they stole it from the Bible. A lot of people do that, don't they? They steal things from the Bible and say they're very, very smart. But I was actually looking at a video that a couple missionaries went to a tribe that the gospel has never reached. And they finally got there. And what did they find there? No TV, no running water, no electricity, nothing. But what was there? Coca-Cola. And I'm like, Coca-Cola has been around for 200 years. The gospel has been around for 2,000 years plus. How have we not reached this, but Coca-Cola has? And there's a slogan that Coca-Cola has that I really like. It's think globally, act locally. And if that is in the best mission statement that you could have as a Christian. Think of how God wants to save all of mankind, but think about how God wants to use you where you're at to save men and women and children and youth that are around you. That is the purpose. So what can I do? That's what we can do. God has called us to build, not, not to build treasures while we're here, earthly treasures, but he's called us to be a light in the world of darkness. He has called us to lead people to the Savior. It is in the Savior that we are free from sin. We're free from ourselves. I can live from Christ and not from myself anymore. That should be the true joy of somebody's life. And once you're free from the power of sin over your life, free from yourself, you can finally join God in saving mankind by reminding yourself that first, missions is the heart of God. Missions is the hope of the condemned, and missions is the health of the church. Churches are as healthy when they get involved in God's work around the world. That's what makes us healthy. Not how, not how beautiful our building is, but how beautiful 
the message of grace that God has placed in our hearts to share with the world. That is what God has called us to do. Christ alone can save the world, but Christ chose not to save the world alone. He chose you and me as his partners. Now the question is, will we take up that mission? Will we encourage people who are sharing the gospel? Will we ourselves share the gospel? Nathan, I'm not an evangelist, but you a Christian. You're not a football player either, but you sure like to talk about footballs on Sunday, don't you? Yeah. That is what Christ has called us to do, to share what God has put in our heart. So what is in your heart? Is it the message of grace? Is it the, 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 the same gospel that saved you from a condemned lifestyle, from a, a selfish lifestyle? Is that what God saved you from? Is that what's in your heart? Then you better share that with everything you have. You better support people who do that. Pray for them. Be a part of people's life. Disciple. Encourage. Motivate. That is what God has called us to do. Like, his, like God the Son. Become missionaries in our own place, in our own way. Supporting missionaries. Supporting people that have the desire to see mankind saved. We'll have God's purpose in our hearts. That is what God's called us to do. And before I close um, in prayer, actually, I'll close in prayer, and then I, I have a short video that I wanted to show, to share with everybody. Um, it's a ministry that we do for, it's called Project Abba. We do a Christmas celebration every year. And the teenagers are actually planning an event next Saturday. The teenagers are organizing the entire event. We're planning on having 150 plus kids, and the teenagers are doing everything. They're sharing the gospel, they're doing small groups, they're planning, they're dancing, you know, everything. And, uh, and this is, in the video I'm going to show, is a video of our project, uh, our Christmas project that we do every year. And with $10 a kid, we provide them with a set of clothes, toy, uh, food, opportunity to, share the to hear the gospel. A big event for them, very fun, you're going to see in the video there. But this is one of the ways that we've done this. And a lot of the youth that are in the church, because of the kids' ministry, the elders at the church, one of our churches in Ibuda, I mean, many of the churches actually, but one of our churches in Ibuda, all of the elders used to be kids that were reached by Project Abba. And I just think that's crazy. I think that's awesome. And so, how about we bow our heads, we pray, and we ask the Lord. And as, as you're bowing your heads, closing your eyes, I want you to have a moment for yourselves to really think of what God, what's God's plan for your life? What, is he, what does he wish to do through you? What job has he placed in your life? What family has he placed you in their lives? That you're the only person that can get the grace of God in there the message that he placed in your heart, what does he want you to do with this? How does he want you to share this with the people around you? How does he want you to encourage the people at your church? What financial means has he given you to be able to, 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 to share with others, to bless others, to use that as an opening door to share the message to others? What has God called you to do? Dear God, we thank you, Lord, for another amazing day, another beautiful Sunday. We thank you for your very clear mission. We thank you for letting us and allowing us to be a part of this, to be able to, to, to be part of this great plan to save mankind through your love, through your grace. And we pray, Lord, for motivation, for encouragement, that we may leave our homes, leave our, our comfort zones to be able to be the believers that are willing to take the next step and share your message with the people around us. There's no point in complaining about a fallen world if we are not able or if we are not ready to be the ones used by you to bring your love into the world to share the grace message for today, what you have shared with us. God, we just pray for 
each person here, we pray for each person at any other church that they may have the same mission, that we may be a healthy church willing to, to share this message with the world. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thank you for having me. It's a quick video and then... What is the most important group that you've ever belonged to? Your family. Now they could have impacted you in a positive way, they could have impacted you in a negative way, but they had a big influence in your life. Many kids don't have positive influences. And what if you can make that kid this Christmas feel like they were loved, feel like they were cherished, feel like they belonged? That is what Project Abba has been doing for many years. And we have impacted the lives of thousands of kids through your partnership. And we would like to keep on doing so. In 2024, we plan to reach many more kids for the grace of God and show them that they belong to this family. And that's why we are calling you through your prayers, your donations, your gifts, your service, to be able to become partners with us in 2024 and bless the lives of many kids. So why don't you, in 2024, come join Project Alba?